Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. I am your host, John Jewett. And I am your co-host, Luke Miller. Our mission is to elevate the physique coaching standard. And deliver the highest level of competitors to the stage. Let's jump into today's episode. Top five leg training mistakes. So, legs are a huge part to win shows in bodybuilding. A lot of people say shows are won from the back, but you can't neglect the legs. And we also talk about hamstrings, glutes. Um, and for a lot of people, leg training is a struggle. Most of us aren't blessed like Big Rami to have that be just the strongest body part where you can almost just not even train them and just have a complete bodybuilder already. So uh, that's what we'll cover today. Luke, how's it going, man? I'm good. I'm a little sleep deprived. So if I like start slurring my words here together, just uh, give me some grace. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I I have I have no idea. Like I've had new puppies. That's uh, the closest <laughs> thing I can I can relate. But I'm sure a new baby is uh, is a is a real challenge. Yeah, but she's beautiful. Uh, she came out a whopping seven pounds one ounces and has a head full of hair. So she's she's a she's a beautiful little baby. But woo, she needs to learn how to sleep. <laughs> I'm sure it'll level off. But you know. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just encur- <laughs> encouraging. I just want to encourage. Yes, it's going to get better. <laughs> How's your prep going before we dive in? You're 20 weeks out, 21? Yeah, I'll be coming up on 20, on 20 weeks out. Yeah. So, um, no, going well so far. Uh, just this past week was good to get back in town after moving my mom, which that – uh. That was just like super high output, so I ended up dropping a, a bit of weight there, which is fine. Like it was, yep. It wasn't like a deload at all. It was like, <laughs> still moving, but I was definitely like, um, some some output made me pull a little bit of body fat off. Actually, um, then this week weight got I actually started coming back up a little bit, but I think it was what I realized, and maybe here we'll enjoy the transparency. <laughs> I talked about this on my U- YouTube is. Like I, we traveled down to see my, my, my mom's place and I didn't take any like growth hormone with me. And then, so that wasn't there. And then on top of just like moving a lot, I I dropped like quite a bit of weight. It was like five pounds dropped off over these like four days, which I'm like, man, this, I didn't expect that. But, um, then like reintroducing it when I got back home, like weight started trending up pretty quickly again. I'm like, huh, like, how am I not in this deficit? And so that's what it was. It was like this past week was a little blurred with the scale weight, but also trying to assess, you know, what uh, what physique changes were really happening visually. Uh-huh. So, but then I like, it clicked all for me. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what's going on. Um, so now this, now it's like back to being like consistent changes um, with scale weight being consistent too, but no, no, in a in a good spot right now. Yeah, so plenty, plenty of time. Renee's the one that's doing like crazy stuff that I'm jealous of. She's like dropping body fat and and like scale weight barely changes. She just looks harder. It's just like, yeah. I show her pictures. She's like, I don't know. Like, what do you, <laughs> you don't know, <laughs> dude. You sent me those pictures, and I was like, holy shit! I I saw the pictures before I read the message, and I was expecting like the visual change was looked to me like 11, 12 pound difference, like fat loss. And it was like two pounds. And I was like, what the heck, what are you doing? And, you know, we obviously just discussed it a little bit, but, um, yeah, especially like through her glutes, like the glute to hamstring tie in type area was like massively different. Yeah. Renee can, can respond kind of freaky at times. So, um, lucky duck. Yeah, yeah, it's it's cool, but she's just you know when you're trying to like for most people like you can't coach yourself because looking at yourself it's just you don't see it and you only still look at the negatives. So she kind of does that and until I like have to really if once I point out she's like oh, okay I can see that <laughs> I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if she looked at me or someone else she'd be like oh yeah yeah they're changing here and there and but for herself like no so yeah she's uh she's moving along. Well, well, and 
Go. That gets the topic for a wellness that, was- that only trains <laughs> legs, <laughs> right? Transition into our point of uh, five five leg training mistakes that we commonly see. Yeah. And the one we'll kick off with is number one, training full range of motion. And not just training full range of motion, but getting to those ranges and also controlling and owning them. Yeah, I think I think this is probably one of the hardest for people to learn that are taught to just train hard because I think this is where I was for a long time is you just, you put the blinders on and effort takes over. And if that effort loses precision, then you're not worried about it. And because it's just like move the bar, move the load, progressive overload type of a thought process. And I think, Looking back, it's probably the biggest difference in my training that led to the most progression because we're going to get to like why effort is such a big piece of leg training later. But when you look at like controlling in ranges and our opportunity to load lower body fibers, the largest impact that we can have for like growth of the lower body is going to be within the bottom of those major compound movements. Because even if you just look at like the top three major compounds, hip hinging, which we'll discuss some of the problems with, we see that in a second, it's like very large load and length in position, squatting any, pretty much any squat position minus like a pendulum, very large loading in the bottom end range. And then leg press, same thing, like the 45 degree leg press. So it's, it's such a valuable position to gain leaps forward with the amount of total tension that we put on the target tissues, which we talked about in the hypertrophy one was, you know, such a large portion of the total internal stimulus of mechanical tension that I think when you see like the bouncing off the bottom of the hack squat or the bottom of the leg press, it leads to such sub suboptimal stimulus for overall leg development. Yeah, with in you know, we mentioned this before, but training into those like long muscle links because in in a lot of those positions, once you get the muscle in that position, uh, usually like in a squat or leg press or even a hip hinge, like that working joint is really far away from the line of force, so that muscle is almost disadvent and advantageous to lift the load. So you're really, really challenging that muscle and it's having to create a lot of internal mechanical tension to make that joint move. And so that's when you're really going to have the greatest hypertrophy stimulus that can occur there. And so not getting into like the largest range of motion possible that you can control is really leaving progress on the table. So even though, you're able to put more load in the bar and just cut a few inches short. It doesn't mean it's more stimulus internally. And I think that's what's so confusing when we talk about mechanical tension for many. You think, yeah, more load means more tension. And it doesn't if you're cutting like the range of motion short or you're just using momentum and stretch reflex to like bounce out of the bottom. It doesn't mean you're getting more tension in the muscle and challenging the muscle to work. Because that's really is, is bodybuilding. It's trying to make the lift nearly as hard as possible that the load likely could be lighter than over time you increase that load. But not just trying to lift the heaviest load possible. Um, and that's when you turn into a powerlifter <laughs> and not a bodybuilder. I think there's like an asterisk there of like injury management too where you can really – manage someone's proclivity to be injured if you're able to teach them the full control in the end ranges right like we're all going to get like little dings and little niggles and that kind of stuff it just comes with the territory of training hard but as far as like chronic injuries like like tears and things along those lines your ability to to control these end ranges is going to allow you to stay away from that because if you do it from the beginning all injuries are is is load exceeding tissue tolerance. So the ability for the tissue to handle load. And there's a couple factors that go into that that's not for this podcast. But if we are controlling the end ranges, the likelihood that we're going to go into inertia taking us past that tissue tolerance is a lot less because we've 
been there the entire time and we're taking load progressions with that as a constant. And I think this is really where when I have people coming in with injury profiles, I'll, I have like a range of, of videos that I do per week with clients, like five to 10 is typically kind of like the, the range of training videos. I'll be like, look, I need you to send 10 the first four weeks. Cause we've got to fix this. Like you have an injury profile. I need to figure out why you have the injury profile And nine times out of 10. It's something to do with getting to these end ranges and controlling them with load that they can handle. Yeah. I'll tell you right. Like my, my injuries resulted around that too. Um, it was movements where I could, there was the potential to have a lot of range and I wasn't going into those ranges. And I'm sure it was just a moment with the load dipping a little farther past the range I normally train in. And that was it on top of like accumulating fatigue, like session to session. Right. Yep. So that connected tissue is already a little, a little bit, maybe more prone to not tolerating as much. Yeah. So yeah, all those things contribute. And, you know, you know, with that being said, like, and just a simple thing about what, what does this end range get to? It's basically like if you're doing a, a squad focused movement, like trying to get as much knee flexion as possible or a hamstring focused movement, hamstrings are a little different, but at least if it's a hip hinge, like trying to get the hip to flex as much as possible while either maintaining the knee or keeping the hip flexed in bending at the knee. Uh-huh. So, um, and same goes for glutes, right? Trying to get as much hip flexion as possible to get those those full uh, muscle links. And, you know, there, there can be transition points for people, like if you're trying to get into those ranges and you feel like you lack some stability and control, uh-huh. and that's when you get into exercise selection for, like, regression patterns. And where some of these things that, you know, people can, like, really battle on these about, like, <laughs> say, you know, say, like, uh, ban- banding a hack squat, like reverse banding it to where it lines a bit of the load in the bottom. Like if you're someone that hasn't been training into that range, like that's a tool to be used to help get someone into that range and then build up that load in that new range. And also it slows down that dynamic movement so they can have a, a bit more control and learn to stabilize all those joint positions. So th- I know things like that have, have application but I agree, like, from, a, from a, a safety and risk standpoint, like, that's your best thing to do. It's not your, – your safety prevention is not just stretching the muscle. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, just a stretch. Like, let me go stretch it out. It feels tight. Uh, let me go foam roll it. Like, yeah, the, it absolutely has, like, a, a an immediate, like, perception of reduced tightness. But really, like, to really gain – range of motion and control those range of motion, you have to train in them and get stronger in them. And so that's uh, really your, your biggest tool to be utilizing. Do we think we should now get to the second point? Yes. I was going to say that you, you brought up the sin against the hypertrophy guys with the band on the hack squat or the band in the squat pattern. Cause like we, we, I love the trends we go through in the fitness industry. There was like a year and a half where everybody was banding their hack squat. And then now it's like the worst sin against the hypertrophy gods that you can do. But uh, I think that does bring us to picking the right squat, right? Like I think, or, or picking the wrong squat being the issue that we see because this is where the emotional attachment piece comes in that we talked about in the last episode, which if you haven't listened to, like definitely go take that a listen. That's like everything that has to do with hypertrophy because we get these people that are emotionally attached to certain squat patterns. I see it a lot with like hack squats, especially, um, or I have people coming in that are switching sports, like being really attached to a barbell sometimes. Um, but this is where we really need to take the time to, in my opinion, do this on the forefront of the entry of a client. This is where your ability to coach is going to allow for that client to thrive because we need to be putting the client through testing parameters to see how this individual moves in order to pick the right squat pattern that's for this person. Now, this is where I I get very detailed with the videos that they have to send me from the forefront, where if I know there's issues, there's like a laundry list of things I have to have them send, which some people could say is is a little bit overkill, but I'm doing that in order to pick the right squat from the very beginning 
because it allows them to take the step in the right direction in order to nail execution, train these full in ranges, and give them something to progress over time. And this is where we're going to see clients make the massive progression over time, especially with clients that lower body development is the main issue. This is where I spend a lot of my time is picking the right squat. And what that does is it informs me of what the main limitations for that client are. And then it allows me to pick the other movements that fit according to those movement limitations. And so like just as a prime example, let's say someone like me who is lax in dorsiflexion has a tendency to move into a lot of hip travel with a squat position and used to have hip issues as far as like the ability for femur to rotate a couple other things we're looking at someone who's going to need to be the furthest down the regression pattern on the squat pattern that they need to do but then the secondary movements need to allow them to reach those end ranges where they can progress their ability to get into that bottom end range and so this is where that whole program design starts to come into play is just picking the right squat to drive the right stimulus and so and you can get into like why we're choosing these squats like for which goal but I think this is such an important piece of the initial consult part that's not done very often. And I think it's how we can take clients from having poor legs into really strong legs is just getting that piece right. Yeah, those are some great points. And that really is what it comes down to is how can this person move right now? And what is the goal in their physique that they need, need to bring up? And then how do we align those two things with an exercise choice? And I feel like a lot of people are just making the exercise choice. What looks really good on paper, maybe as a coach as themselves or what has worked for other athletes without considering, Hey, how can this athlete even move and conduct that exercise? And also when they get into that movement, like, is it biased towards what they really need physique wise? And so when Luke and I are talking about a squat, it doesn't mean just a barbell back squat because that's probably the first thing that comes to your mind. It's really anything that has a, a squat component to it. So whether this is a pendulum or a hack squat, a, a split squat, um, any variation of a back squat. So that's heel elevated, a safety squat bar. Um, all, all these things are, are ways that we can manipulate how load's going to move through a person and joint position to, to bias them. So like, like Luke, he might need that heel elevation and like a safety squat bar to, to get himself more upright for a more quad bias squat. While someone like myself, like a shorter femur that also has like really kind of wild uh, ankle mobility, like I can squat very upright. So a barbell back squat still might be quad biased for me. But so the, the thing is, is that there is no exercise you, you must do in that conversation. Uh, the right exercise is just going to be the one that is right for your ability to conduct it. Uh -huh. So don't think you have to back squat. Um, you don't. I, I think there's a value in having a movement where you have to have a lot of bracing internally in some form of squat pattern, but that doesn't have to be a barbell back squat either. So yep. Um, I th and that for that person, like you brought up, Luke, like if that person can't yet c conduct that then we should have some other movements that maybe challenge them and, and build that up. So I think uh, the split squat could be a bit underutilized because what like one trend was, was like we should always be in very braced movements for hypertrophy, like a hack squat or a pendulum, a leg press, which yes, like the, those have the greatest potential, but also <clears throat> for someone that didn't have like the ability to do that back squat and maybe that was an injury that occurred eventually as they get stronger in a hack squat, if that's not addressed, they're going to get injured again. So it's like, Hey, okay, well, let's do your hack squat, but also let's build in something that really challenges your ability to stabilize and gain some of that end range, which uh, a unilateral pattern, like a split squat can, can do that really well. So those are, uh, yeah, just, just conceptually some ways you might be progressing someone and trying to choose the right squat for them to get back to our first point of like getting that big end range at around the joint. 
for that muscle you're trying to bias. Yeah, and and we cover how to pick this in AHO, right? The applied hypertrophy optimization model. We kind of walk them through like what are we looking for in the squat and how how to pick that, and just to kind of give the audience something to to operate off of. I think you can work off the basic regression pattern of the barbells back squat being kind of like your standard to work off of and each regression from there kind of being something similar to safety bar, Smith machine squat, hack squat, pendulum and operating kind of through that regression. And there's a lot of in between squats with all those squat machines we have nowadays, but um, that's kind of like, just like a operating tool for some value for you guys. But we, we do cover how to pick that in, in AHO very, very in depth. And I think that brings us to the third point, which I'm going to let John start on since he's the adductor king because his adductors go from one side of the world to the other. So I think we're going to let him start with the, the adductor. Number three. <laughs> Just, yeah, number three is not even training the adductors. Um, and I totally get it. Like going into the you know, the adductor machine, it seems like a vulnerable position. <laughs> and a lot of times you just see like, uh, you see females on a bikini athletes. You're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's not for me. Like, I don't need that. Um, but the adductors, like if you look at like stage shots, when someone has fully developed adductors, it gives a width to the quad that you wouldn't be able to achieve otherwise. And really when you're standing on a bodybuilding stage, you're trying to basically, fill in as much air, air space as possible and make any gaps filled. And that is one. So we're trying to have no thigh gap with, with, uh, you know, our leg training and filling in those adductor spots. So also just like with adductors, even from the back, like in your rear shot, like a lot of times you guys usually hit with their hamstrings to get them contracted and glutes adductors get sucked up. But if you have like really big adductors, you can get away with like squeezing everything a little bit harder in your back shots and allowing some adductor to disappear for the benefit of bringing in more other details. So, but adductors like for training them absolutely should happen. And, and like, I didn't do a lot of direct adductor work because I'm not the person to ask, like, how do you bring up adductors? Cause I've always had them um, consideration for when you're asking guys about that have amazing body parts, how to train them probably shouldn't because they are, they've always had them. So with adductors, it's, you, you should definitely do them like direct training for most people. Um, this is like the same idea of like my biceps are going to grow just through doing a lot of rowing. Uh. That's usually not the case, right? You also have to do some direct bicep work. Well, same thing. Like your adductors do function in your squat patterns, your leg press, especially squits, uh, split squat patterns. Yep. Um, even like I, when I powerlifted, I did a lot of like sumo stance, wide stance, squatting. Like adductors come into a big role in those type of patterns. So when you're in, in hip flexion, deep, like deep in a squat, especially a wider stance squat, um, adductors can contribute a lot in hip extension. So getting out of the hole. So they really get challenged in that lengthen end range position. But for a lot of people, that's just not enough. And to actually train them directly is what needs to happen. So when to train them is part of the question here. Um, and it depends on really what you need for one. Are they that big of a priority? If they are, then put your priorities at the front of a session with the caveat that training adductors first in the session doesn't limit your ability to do the squat or the hip hinge next because the adductors do have a, a, a pretty big role in stabilizing the hip through these movements. Uh -huh. So if they're like really fatigued and get or get into a squat pattern, you can't control the end range of that really big movement that could be risky. So I would want to just see like, Hey, what's the next movement that that person does? So if it's, they move to like a hack squat, that's real braced afterwards. Like, okay. That would be fine, but if it's like a barbell back squat and they're ad doing adductor movement first. I, I probably wouldn't program it like that. I would probably then put it at the end of the session. Uh -huh. um, but there's still a way you could probably get around that where we could look at how we're moving volume, which I won't be a spoiler and 
to talk about that mm. yet. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the J3U podcast thus far. We are very excited to announce that the Applied Hypertrophy Module, our newest course on J3U, has just released. AHO is an extremely valuable asset for coaches and athletes who want to take their training and their clients' training to the next level. In the Applied Hypertrophy Module, we take you inside the gym where we cover over 40 exercises with five plus hours of video, every cue for every exercise, optimal and alternative movement choices for each muscle group, movement assessment techniques, and how to program these exercises for yourself and for your clients. Alongside the course, you will also receive our exercise index and program designer eBooks. For the next three days only, you will receive $100 off the course for a launch sale with the code AHO100. We look forward to joining you on the gym floor. Let's get back to today's episode. <laughs> I think uh, I think to address what will, will be brought up with that that comment or that point is because there's there's some people who have like a, a pretty big emotional attachment to training adductors out of the gate, right? And they cite eccentric loading on the adductors in order to be able to gain more access to get into the hole. Um, and I think there's sub maximal ways we can eccentrically load an adductor that's not going to take away from our ability to stabilize the pelvis in the bottom of a squat with prep work before the session that would allow you to gain that access. I think it's the, and I've been here before, so I'm not saying something that I, I, I haven't I've done. done. It too. It's okay. The, the late, the lazy man's way of prepping for a squat is to do the adductor work first, right? I, I get it from a prioritization standpoint. That's fine. That's a, gr a great way to do it. If you can manage the load in your squat pattern next, but if you just took the time to structure prep work in a way that allows you to gain access to that in range position, put some eccentric load on the adductor in a submaximal way, you'll find your squat pattern will massively improve and you'll limit your capacity to potentially be injured because your adductors will have full capacity to stabilize the pelvis in the bottom of the squat. And then you can do your adductor work second. And I'll cover kind of the solution to that when we get to the last point, but, um, a little bit more in depth, but that is typically the biggest emotional attachment one that I see with the adductor first is just some people have follow their favorite influencer who does it. And so they, they think that that's a solution to all their leg gains. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't think it's for maybe I don't think it's lazy. It's not out of that. Right. I think it's out of just being for one, it could work. Yeah, it absolutely can work and not be a problem, but also just might be, uh, naive to programming right mm. and um you're yeah you follow someone along you don't even know about prep work yet like I, I didn't know about that stuff so that uh that has a good logical rationale like loading a muscle like through a stretch through a centric like yeah it can gain gain range and then your squat might feel better yeah i, I think that that all can can make sense for the like more inexperienced person that's going through it mm -hmm. um so that, but then you have to make a point of like you know, is, is that even the limiting factor for, for the person? And I think the person that picks that up as this is what, you know, I'm watching someone do and they explain it that way, that might be their limiting factor. But for yourself, it, it might not be. And I think more commonly what I see is the range at the ankle is a limiting factor. So you might Absolutely. make a case of like doing, well, I'm going to do my calf work first. Um <laughs> And so now you're doing your calf work first, you're doing your adductor work first, which people do, and it could be just fine also. Uh, just depends, like, what are those next exercises coming up afterwards? Um, but for other people, say if you're going to be walking out some big squat and now your calves are fatigued, your adductors are fatigued, like, it, it might take away from the, the squat. Um, if you're doing calf work first, then you have, like, a hack squat, like, yeah, it probably doesn't matter. matter. Like, yeah. so it just, it, it's one of those where it depends. It can have application, but it's why I'm, we want to give you like the thought process there of like, should this matter for me or not? Mm. Um, but there, just like Luke said, there's other ways to be able to load the calf eccentrically without fatiguing it and the adductors and then get into your, your session from there. Well, I think that brings us to, to point four. Yeah. The, yes. our favorite hip hinging. I love this. I was born to do this, but 
very aggressively and emotionally. Um, and I think that's where the thought process starts to go with the, the problems we see within hip hinging, because it's a very valuable movement when done well. And I love this with all of my heart. I think hip hinging was kind of my emotional expression into bodybuilding. Like I think just any hinging pattern, whether it was deadlifting or RDLs or whatever it may be, just like I used to be psychopathic about like deadlifting. I remember before, before I even understood what programming was, like I would do deadlift drop sets, like four plates, deadlift, strip a plate, deadlift, strip a plate, deadlift. Like it was, I just appreciated how brutal it was. And I think that's kind of where that, that, that psychological attachment came from for me. And I see this a lot with the clientele that we, we get is, is they, have a very big attachment to moving large load with hinging because it's been discussed as one of the biggest bang for buck exercises. And I think it, it can be, but I think when we talk about actually developing the lower body through the posterior chain, as far as hamstrings specifically, especially, this is where we see a lot of people turn hinging into this Dorian dead, where it's a lot of glute, even a little quad with the amount of knee bend that they're, they're bringing in and their ability to brace the load and then just hamstring involvement is just not there. And we're it's like a rack pull. It's like a rack right? pull. Yeah. And it's detaching, it's detaching the goal from the exercise. And that's where we see a lot of problems with it is like the goal with hinging most of the time within programming is eccentrically loaded hamstrings. So high hip position, large amount of rotation in order to keep the hips high in the fully lengthened hamstring. And then you see this like hip travel back and drop with the knee bend that's just semi squat, semi hinge. And I, I teach squatting and hinging on a spectrum because to me that's like full Asian squat, like sitting straight up like Olympic lifter is one end of the spectrum. And then the hinge with like the hips high mats of amount of travel is one in the spectrum and everything kind of falls in between. And I see a lot of people hinging closer to the squat portion of the spectrum than actually closer towards like the SLDL portion of the spectrum. Yeah. It's easy for those form shifts to happen too, like over time with like, let me up the load like I could do this last time. And you just have the hips just sink just a little bit more. Yeah. And then after eight weeks, it's like it really changes uh, because it is a lot of like joints to have to standardize in space mm -hmm. without the perception of where are those joints without watching your videos. So I, I, I get that. And I, I've been there too where the little shifts happen. So like film your lifts and have some review on those. But you know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing an SLDL right now and my, my, it's, it's, my load is so, uh, so low. <laughs> like I was like, uh, cause I, I've, I've pulled, I've pulled heavy before, but I'm like right at like 430 pounds for like 10 reps. Um, but they're very strict, like they're dead stop and, um, very high hipped, which again, the point being like training the hamstrings and that end range. Uh -huh. um, and I, I've had a lot of hamstring injuries doing RDLs uh, because I would turn it into basically a, a rack pull and keep going up and load. And then I have that just half an inch lower than I normally would with the certain load. And there it goes, like pop a hamstring. So it's, it's just a, it's a safety net as well for like trying to make the lift as hard as possible, especially for that one where like right out the gate it's loaded fully lengthened um so i still like cue like keeping a soft knee and i'm a bit more forgiving like if a little bit of knee bends happening like that's okay opposed to it, the knee going the opposite way um and and like over over stretching or getting to that range where you really don't so yeah i mean it depends on like what what is your goal with that hip hinge and if it's hamstring based then we should be aiming to keep those hips high now, if you're like wellness or you just need glute for some reason, yeah, making it more of an RDL where the hips really push back away far from the bar, allowing a little bit more knee bend, 
that would be catered to your goal. Mm-hmm. So it depends on, you know, what that movement is set up like. And like you said, for the person within a spectrum, because you don't have to do the perfect stiff leg and get the form police out and everyone's going to critique you really hard if you have a little bit more knee bend that's allowable. Um, now, it's okay to have a spectrum within that, but also standardize that so it's not just shifting to just move more load over time. I think the last one is like the purist to the floor. Like the SLDL has to be to the floor or the RDL has to be to the floor. I think that's pertinent to bring yeah. up because – for most people that turns into some version of lumbar flexion in that bottom end range. And like, I think even you, you're doing yours off of the the rack with the catches, right? Is that where you're doing yours? No, no, I I do them off the ground. Okay. Yeah. When I was there, I did them off the racks and the difference between like your ability to get to the floor and my ability to get to the floor was massively different. We actually have a training video on this where you guys can see this. Um, but this just even further goes to the point of when we talk about training full in ranges in the earlier point, this is very specific to each individual's capacity to move because I have longer femurs than John. I'm a little taller than John. And so me getting into a fully lengthened hamstring position is actually like a couple inches off the ground where for John, it's actually getting all the way to the floor. And this is where we really need to understand what this hinge looks like because a lot of people just think full range all to the floor especially some of my taller guys like my six foot six one classic guys it's like man they end up turning into like three or four inches of lumbar flexion just to get there yeah i've uh i had a classic guy we we actually had a (laughs) conventional deadlift in and the last few inches it just fell apart and you could see like it wasn't even that it was cueing. It was more like structurally. He just could, it just wasn't going to happen. So it's like, just let's just put on blocks and like pull from those blocks. And that was it. That like corrected it easily um, and allowed to train through his body is full range, not, you know, the, from the ground up. Uh. That is just the prerequisite like range set. It's just like on a hack squat or whatever. It's like, well, this is the, how the machine operates through this range of motion. It's like, well, that's what you must do. It's like, no, no, it's still like based on the person and how how they can get into their ranges based on their structure. Yeah, and I think I think that's everything for hinging. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And like, and don't think too that you have to do a hip hinge because ah, uh, that's yeah. Luke and I were mentioning this before we got on that since it is such a complex movement and also. It, it is very fatiguing. Like it can take a lot from that session that if you have someone that you're constantly having to correct this movement and also emotionally, it's really hard from them to detach from it that you might just need to pull it out. And I'm all for like someone enjoying their training. So if you need it in and that's like the big thing that for the day that they get excited about training for, and they're going to train it hard. You have to make the, the balance an argument of whether that should stay in or not. But if you look at the hip hinge when you're in that start position and the hips are bent, the, the leg's pretty straight, if you were just to flip that person onto their ass, uh, basically they would be in a seated leg curl position. So a seated leg curl has great application to train the hamstrings fully lengthened, and you can suit that need for hamstring development, but also being in a much more braced pattern that won't be as overall fatiguing so Uh um, you know if you have someone that has like they're going to do a a back squat and load the erectors on another day you usually could program in like the seated leg curl and and not necessarily need the hip hinge for like the the also the erector work that you might be gaining from it i agree so that that last point so going to point number what are we on five five (laughs) yeah yeah uh Volume tolerability and how we should be adjusting volume around someone that is going to prioritize legs. And so this isn't just looking at exercise order, but also session order Uh. throughout the week. And for leg training, you can get a lot done within one leg session. But at some point, if that volume requirement for you, you need whatever, 10 sets of quads and hamstrings or plus 
to do it all in one session, something's going to really get hit a lot with fatigue and really drop in ability to just keep performing at a high, high output level. So you might need two sessions for legs, and that's really common of how we program. Three sessions might be possible if you're doing someone that's like like the wellness competitor that only trains upper body once or not at all. So you can have a, a lot of this you know, volume allocated towards lower body. But uh. that's the trade-off, right? So if you have this have only so much money on the bank, you can only spend X amount here and there, you have to allocate it wisely, and sometimes you might not be able to spend as much towards upper body. And that's how you have to think about like how you're allocating volume. If you really need to bring up legs, they're a very fatiguing muscle group to train, and they also can uh, easily build up a lot of fatigue. So having to pull back in areas and allocate volume there might might happen. And I see that mistake happen a lot where people want to bring up legs. They add in more legs on top of already doing a full upper body at, you know, maximum volume tolerance and they just don't progress. And then they deload real quick. (laughs) So, um, having to pull back volume in an upper and allocate it to lower Mm -hmm. is one thing that might happen. Yeah. I think within that too, like even just split structure setup is, is important because this is something that me and you have gone back and forth on quite a bit, depending on where our training is at a time at the time. Um, and I remember we were talking about, we were discussing my program when I was kind of making that comeback from the fertility protocols. Like, you know, I was downsized trying to get back into, uh, the, the, the level of size that I'd had. So training legs twice a week, which hadn't happened much, uh, for me because of legs being a stronger body part, um, was, was splitting that volume up across the sessions from a compound movement perspective. And I think this is something that's very valuable. And then also timing those around rest days. Yeah. If it's something that's a big priority for you, in my opinion, a lot of those leg sessions should come after a rest day because it is something that it requires a lot to go into and be able to continually progress, especially when the frequency is high. But when we look at splitting the volume up across the week, I really like splitting the compounds into two or three sessions. And what that may look like is for someone who's like running an extremely specialized program is you have one session built around the squat, one session built around the leg press pattern and one session built around the hinge. Whether that's across seven days or eight days or nine days is just going to be how you set up that split. And that's where you build each session off of. And I think when you're able to do that, each compound is so far towards the front that you're able to get a maximal amount of tension stimulus out of each pattern and be fully recovered by that next leg day. Because now you're not going in there and your leg days being this like three hour marathon that's just freaking exhausted after where two or three days later you still haven't fully recovered from that leg session and then you're having to train legs again and then it's just not not the high quality stimulus and so in order to do that i do think there has to be an athlete that understands the ethos of training legs and i think john you you had a great way of of the putting the prerequisite for training legs that you could share with the audience yeah, it's because we talk about volume, and what I don't want is someone just to go, let me just add in more volume. Yeah. Because I think a lot, there are plenty of people that can train insanely hard and they need to get pulled back. There's also people that, for leg training, it's the one where many people aren't pushing it close to that proximity of failure. Uh-huh. There's just a lot left on the table. And far enough from even like, we, we would talk like reps in reserve, like two reps in reserve, like that's still a really hard set. Some people are like five reps in reserve and not getting even close to like these stimulating reps. So to get pushed and you need someone there that can show you the way. And it's (laughs) my analogy is like, you know, kind of like two virgins getting together (laughs) to get it on. And it's like, yeah, we, we think that was great. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you pair that version up with the well-experienced uh, bedroom athlete, then they're going to be like, oh, wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's really supposed to be like, right? So if you have a, a training partner uh, that 
knows the way and it knows what failure is, it knows what hard training can can guide you into that, that's a huge value. So it's almost is the value training hard or is the value like having a training partner? Well, well the training partner depends. But to really have guidance into getting that volume to really high quality for leg training, there's there's so much value in and that it's gonna take you very, very far. And a lot of times what we see is like once we establish that volume can come down sometimes, yep. especially as you get more advanced and the load and reps that you're doing, like every rep is very stimulating. You can use less sets. So, but to achieve that, yeah, you have to have the prereq of being able to train the set hard to begin, to begin with. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of that minutia, like volume tolerability adjustments start to come into light is you're really getting more out of the athlete that knows how to do that. And that's where it really starts to shine because especially with, and I have a couple of people on the roster that this has been really valuable with the ability to address one portion of leg development. That's a problem. Like let's say quads is the issue for an athlete. We can really choose compounds that fit that person at a high frequency that drives a lot of mechanical tension in a lengthened position very frequently throughout the training split when this is done well. And I think this is where we can really leapfrog someone's development through a portion of their lower body into being a, a midline or even a strong body part when this is done well. Because if they have the prerequisite of training hard and then you really optimize the efficiency of that athlete by giving them very high quality stimulus every three to four days, it really allows them to, to leapfrog. And I even see this, you brought this up at the beginning of the podcast. They say back shots win shows. And the biggest issue a lot of people have is like glutes and hamstrings being in. A lot of times from a condition standpoint, that's a development issue. It's not that they didn't diet hard enough. And what is going to allow that individual to fix that development issue relative to the rest of their physique is high quality stimulus at as high a frequency as possible and keeping that within a volume tolerability range they can recover from. That's where I see a lot of these lower body issues fixed, especially when the athlete knows how to get there. It's just directing them in the direction they need to go. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. And I think that wraps up our, our five points to leg training. And yeah, if uh, you want to learn more on your ability to move and what exercises you should be choosing. Then when choosing those exercises, how should you set them up? What cues should you should be doing? Or if you're just having trouble, like, Hey, I have trouble with my squat. Like what should I do? That's why Luke and I created the applied hypertrophy optimization course. We just take you through each exercise, each muscle group and show you how to pick these movements and how to cue them and set them up. So it can get more out of your lifts. So make that volume that you're doing every set, more effective and get the best growth. And we also have some like tr uh, training program PDFs in there to help kind of give you some ideas around, you know, what these split designs should look like for you. So a ton of value. So if this is something that interests you, you like this discussion, check out our course and we'll leave the link below for you. And any questions for us, leave them down below and we'll happy to address them. Talk to you guys next time.